Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for joining us on this holiday Monday. Joe is off today. Right now on Morning News Now, demolished. The remaining sections of that collapsed Florida condo building brought down in a cloud of dust. This morning, the search and rescue effort in Surfside continuing with the tragedy's death toll standing at 24. Bracing for impact, Tropical Storm Elson now battering Cuba with a steady stream of heavy rain and gusty winds. Now has its eyes set on the Florida panhandle. We've got the latest forecast on when the storm system is expected to make landfall. Moving forward, COVID vaccinations here in the U.S. fell decidedly short of Biden's July 4th goal. But the president this morning isn't dwelling on the past. Today, we're closer than ever to declaring our independence from a deadly virus. That's not to say the battle against COVID-19 is over. We've got a lot more work to do. The next steps in the White House push to boost shot rates in under-vaccinated parts of the country. And oh say can you eat. A commemoration of America's founding wouldn't be complete without a jaw-dropping performance from hot dog world record holder Joey Chestnut at the annual Coney Island contest. We'll bring you his world record run and other less stomach-churning birthday celebrations from across the country. We begin, though, this morning in Surfside, Florida, where search and rescue efforts are back underway after the remaining part of the collapsed condo building was demolished late last night. Operations had been on hold amid concerns about the building's stability. The death toll climbed to 24 over the weekend, with 121 people still unaccounted for. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber is with us now from Surfside. Ellison, good morning. We saw that dramatic video of the final part of the building coming down last night. How is this demolition going to help rescue teams? Could it lead to new discoveries? What do they think is going to happen here? Yeah, so it was just before 1030 last night when we started to hear pops. And then within seconds, that entire building what was left of Champlain Tower South collapsed to the ground. Residents who live nearby that building, they were told to shelter in place and to close their windows because of the dust that would inevitably follow. Crews demolished this building with a process known as energetic felling. They used small strategic detonations and then relied on gravity to bring the building down on the footprint, essentially for it to just drop in place and fall where it stood so that it wouldn't fall over onto that pile of rubble where workers have been diligently working and removing debris for the past 12 days or so. Officials have said that this demolition achieves really two key things. That one, it removes a structurally unsound building in a controlled manner before we potentially see any impacts from Tropical Storm Elsa. And that it also gives rescuers access to a larger search area. Listen here. Bringing the building down in a controlled manner is critical to expanding our scope of search, as you know, in the pile, and allowing us to search in the area closest to the building, which has currently not been accessible to the teams given the great risk to our first responders due to the instability of the So this seemed to be a very necessary demolition, but of course necessary rarely means easy for the families of those unaccounted for. Mm -hmm. There was the potential that, yes, this could expand this search area and maybe help bring their loved ones home, whether that is alive or simply recovered. I have to tell you, many of those families, they are still desperately hoping for a miracle. But of course, Mm -hmm. there was also the possibility that if this didn't fall exactly right, that their family members who were still under the rubble, those efforts to recover them could be further complicated. Then you have people who survived this initial collapse who were never able to return to their homes, their pets, their family photos, Mm -hmm. all of those memories gone with this collapse. So Savannah, a lot of wide ranging emotions here. Understandably from what officials say, this seemed to be very necessary, but obviously again, very much not an easy thing for the families of those still missing or this community. Savannah. Absolutely. And in addition to all those difficulties that you just laid out, those emotional difficulties that, of course, also put the search on hold for a bit. How quickly were search efforts able to resume after the demolition? Amazingly, within minutes, we Mm. actually saw our colleague Von Hilliard was standing on kind of the other side of the building from where we were. And he saw a crew within minutes of that building collapsing, going back in to get to work. When I talked to members of Florida Task Force 2 yesterday, they were on the shift that started at noon and would end at midnight. 
they had told me middle of the day, I thought maybe they were getting a minute to take a break and breathe and recover. And they said, no, we're here. We've moved a couple blocks away, but we're standing by. So as soon as we get clearance, we have our handheld tools. We can get back on there as quickly as possible. It'll take a while longer for all the heavy machinery to be back up and working. But in the immediate aftermath, within minutes, these teams, they went back out with the tools they can use with their hands and got back to searching Mm. uh, in that rubble. Savannah. And Allison, just really quickly, of course, another potential obstacle for this search operation that could put it on hold again is Tropical Storm Elsa. What do we know about that? Yeah, I mean, it, last look, it looked like we were certainly out of the cone, but that doesn't mean that we might not still feel effects of it here. But let me let you listen to what Governor Ron DeSantis said about that just yesterday. Actually, we will hold off on that and I will tell in terms of the impacts for Surfside, which we're obviously very concerned about, could see some gusts, but it has tracked west over the last day and a half, more so than the initial forecast. And so we'll just keep watching that and we'll be ready, we be prepared. but we're prepared to deal with the impacts of the tropical storm in the Keys and on the west coast of Florida. And then obviously we're going to continue with the mission in Surfside. So monitoring that, but officials here locally have said that they do feel like at this point they might have dodged really something that could have been very significant. But obviously, even if you're outside of the cone, that doesn't mean you won't still feel the effects. So that's something officials here are watching very closely, Savannah. Absolutely. Ellison, thank you for your fabulous reporting and you're a pro. I know you're about to ad lib that for us when we didn't think we had the sound. So thank you so much. Cuba is bracing for hurricane-like conditions as Tropical Storm Elsa shows signs of strengthening as it approaches the island. Let's get the latest on this from Janessa Webb, who's with us on this holiday Monday. Hi, Janessa. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Savannah. You know, we have the center of circulation that is just south of Cuba, and we are going to have two landfalls with this storm system. It's going to be really a big time flood threat across central Cuba into the western part. And then it will lose its force just a little bit before it goes back into open water, where it will continue to gain some steam. So right now, 65 mile per hour winds, um, we're still at tropical storm stage. Now, now, there's still that potential when it goes into that Gulf, potentially into a Cat 1 hurricane. So we're going to be watching that pretty closely. There is a northwest movement of 14 miles per hour. It has slowed down just a little. So you can see from the latest track, that cone of uncertainty has really started to come together. It's the Florida Keys to southwest uh, Florida that we're really going to be watching. And then the second landfall for Wednesday evening going into Thursday. Savannah. All right, Janessa, thank you so much for the latest there. The White House just barely fell short of its July 4th vaccination target. President Biden aimed to get 70 percent of Americans at least one COVID vaccine dose by July 4th. And the CDC reports were at 67 percent. In an address to the nation from the White House North Lawn on Independence Day, the president celebrated the progress we have made so far against the virus. On this sacred day, I look out to those monuments on our National Mall and beyond them, into the hearts of our people across the land. And I know this, it's never, ever been a good bet to bet against America. NBC News senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins us now. Shannon, good morning. Now, the president may not have hit that ambitious vaccination target, but he's still trying to get more shots in arms. Can you tell us more about his address last night to the country? What did he say? Well, and he was using this high profile platform to try and urge people to go out and get vaccinated, calling it a patriotic duty and touting the accomplishments the administration has made, thanking scientists and researchers, but again, trying to push to get that that next percentage, that final holdout group of people vaccinated. Here's a little bit more of what he had to say. But the best defense against these variants is to get vaccinated. <laughs> My fellow Americans, it's the most patriotic thing you can do. So please, if you haven't gotten vaccinated, do it. Do it now for yourself, for your loved ones, for your community and for your country. And you mentioned falling short of that 70 percent goal. By our calculations at NBC News, it does look like, though, he will hit it later this month, probably by the end of July.
Now, Shannon, over the weekend, you reported on NBCNews.com that the administration may be running out of incentives to encourage vaccinations, though. I mean, how's the White House going to face this challenge? And, and what do you mean? What have we run out of here? Right. Well, administration officials are basically saying don't expect for any big new initiative. There's not some new lever they have to pull. They're saying look for them to do more of what they've been doing. So getting information out to people through public messaging campaign, through community leaders, making the vaccine even more convenient, more places, more hours to get it, door to door knocking, just more of the same and hoping that over time they can chip away of these holdouts so far by making it more convenient and putting encouragement and incentive out there. Uh, but, you know, they really are in this stage where you've got about 30 percent of people, according to poll numbers, who say they probably won't get it. Uh, and so that is something the administration really is going to try and overcome in the coming months. All right. Shannon Petty Peace, thank you so much. A third Olympian has tested positive for the coronavirus in Japan. The athlete, a member of the Serbian men's rowing team, tested positive during a screening at a Japanese airport. He was sent to a medical facility, and the four other members of his team are now in isolation. This comes after two members of the Ugandan Olympic team tested positive last month. The head of the Ugandan delegation says the team is fully vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Let's now bring in NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson, who is on set with us. She's going to unpack what's happening in Tokyo as well as everything else going on with coronavirus. So first, Priscilla, I mean, this is obviously a concern. These Olympic teams testing, we are just starting to get these athletes there who are getting situated at their training facilities. What do we know about what's going on there and how are officials feeling about this? Yeah, so Tokyo reported more than 715 coronavirus cases on Saturday, and that is the highest number that uh, they have reported there in the last five weeks. And so that is certainly very concerning. The number ticked down a little bit on Sunday, but this, of course, comes as thousands of people are getting getting to that area as the Olympic Games are set to begin in a few um, weeks. And so officials there are looking at what restrictions are going to be placed on domestic spectators. As a reminder, there are not going to be any uh, foreign spectators there. And they're also looking at possibly expanding pandemic restrictions in the capital city um, in order to sort of tap down on those cases. Savannah. Now let's talk here back at home and the Delta variant. We actually have the California Department of Public Health reporting that it's now the dominant strain in California. What's this mean for the state and the country and how concerned are health officials? Yeah, Savannah, so we just got those numbers from the California State Health Department looking at what happened in June. Mm -hmm. And what they're finding is that uh, it is the dominant variant, or it was the dominant variant there in June, with 35.6% of cases being identified as that Delta variant. And to give you a comparative metric, um, that was around 5.6% uh, in May, the number of Delta variant cases in California. And so this is something officials have been warning about for the past several weeks around the world um, because that Delta variant is more contagious and it could lead to more intense health impacts. And so for people who are vaccinated, uh, doctors are saying nothing to worry about. They are protected. But for those people who are not vaccinated, it is certainly very concerning. Yeah, absolutely. I actually know some people, just friends anecdotally, who hadn't been doing anything. And then finally now, you know, have re emerge sort of as we all have gone to a restaurant they're fully vaccinated they did come down with a delta strain this was in california but they just basically have a sore throat it's still protecting them from serious illness exactly right still have that protection but for those millions who aren't vaccinated right. They don't have that, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, Priscilla, let's now talk South Korea. It's, of course, been a model for how to contain the coronavirus. They got it under control pretty quickly, kept it under control. Now they're reporting 700 new cases. How's that happening there, and are they worried? Yeah, and a third straight day of more than 700 cases. So, uh, again, a concerning metric. And so what is happening there, officials are saying, um, and I should point out that 550 of those cases coming out of Seoul. So those big cities mm -hmm. are really... Uh, the issue there. And so officials in Seoul did not um, roll back those pandemic restrictions. Mm. They were waiting to do that. But public health experts say that folks are not being as vigilant as they had been about those safety precautions. And of course, this is happening as the country is working to get their vaccination rate up. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Priscilla Thompson, all the COVID news, news we needed. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Happy for it. And thanks for being here with us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Today is the soft reopening of the U.S.-Canadian border after nearly 16 months of closure. From today, fully vaccinated Canadians will no longer have to quarantine for 14 days after traveling from the U.S., but many restrictions remain in place. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now from the Ambassador's Bridge in Detroit, which links the U.S. and Canada. Shaq, I was just in Detroit, and I could see Canada from my hotel room, which was very exciting to me. (laughs) Good morning. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Good to see you. All right. You spoke to people about the border shutdown. How's this impacting their lives just on a personal level, being able to go places, see people, but also economically? Yeah, a big impact on both ends. Let's talk economics first. You know, the closure estimates say uh, the closure is costing one point five billion dollars each month. When you look at all the international spending or spending by international visitors in Canada, Americans make up about half of that. So you're talking about a significant economic impact for businesses, but then there's also the personal impact. You have people who own homes, own properties right across the bridge in Canada. You also have people who have loved ones right across the border. Listen to a little bit of our conversations with people on this side of the border who have been impacted. The port here on area typically relies on 50% of the business is from the Canadians. So half, at least half. It's not even restaurant industry. It's uh, the boutique down the road. It's the, uh, you know, the person who makes candles, the person who makes wellness products. They're being affected by it majorly. I don't understand why Canadians and Americans can travel to France or Spain, enjoy a holiday together, but we can't reunite with our families and rejoin our properties and say hello to our neighbors, right, that we've known for multi gener- you know, multiple generations, right? Um, very frustrating. That last gentleman there owns a property right across the bridge, right across uh, the river here. So you get a sense of how much this is impacting people, both on the economic aspect, but also the personal. Yeah, absolutely. And what are you hearing, actually, Shaq, from Michigan representatives about the border closure? Are they concerned that it's not getting enough attention? Yeah, not only Michigan representatives, but really representatives across the country, uh, uh, a congressman and congresswoman across the country. You know, we talk about the border all the time, but most of the time we're talking about the southern border, not the 5,500 miles of the U.S.-Canadian border. Listen to one, what, what one representative told us uh, earlier this week. There clearly is not the attention being paid to the northern border like there is to the southern border. Um, And I think, uh, sadly, uh, the Biden administration has had their focus pulled down to the southern border and the crisis that is going on there. And we have to fix that. They have to fix that. But that doesn't mean we should be ignoring the northern border. And and frankly, for those of us in Michigan, you head east into Canada, not just north. Uh, So, I mean, these are these are friends and neighbors that uh, that we should be treating each other better than this. And it's sad that we're at this spot. You mentioned the big headline earlier that Canada is starting to pull back some of those restrictions Mm -hmm. starting today. But we know that it won't go back any further until at least July 21st. But you're hearing pressure from members of Congress, from people who have loved ones right across the bridge. They're pressuring the Canadian government. They're pressuring the United States government to reopen this border as soon as possible. Savannah. And check what's President Biden saying in response? I mean, we know he was in Michigan this weekend as part of his Midwestern tour. Did this come up at all, reopening the border? That's right. He was in Traverse City and he actually did not bring this up that, that much. He's been fairly quiet on this issue. We did hear from the Canadian prime minister this weekend, Justin Trudeau, who said that this is a significant step forward. He called it in this phase reopening that he's uh, rolling out that begins later today. But he's also saying that uh, he's going to use what we see over the next couple of weeks and months with the slow reopening. He's going to use that to determine when the border will fully reopen. So that just gives us a sense that this is not reopening anytime soon. So you can expect pressure on him to increase, but you can also expect pressure on President Biden to continue to increase. You have some members of Congress asking for the United States to unilaterally open their side of the border, Mm. uh, independent of whatever Canada decides to do. Savannah. All right. Shaquille Brewster, thank you so much. Coming up, as the U.S. military withdraws from Afghanistan after nearly 20 years, the Taliban are moving in inside the test of the Afghan government and its security forces up next. Pope Francis is recovering from intestinal surgery. A spokesperson for the Holy See said the Pope, quote, reacted well to the operation, which took place yesterday evening, only a few hours after he delivered his customary Sunday blessing in St. Peter's Square. 
NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Vatican City. Claudio, good morning. Look at that gorgeous backdrop. Tell us more about this operation. And do we know anything about the Pope's condition? Good morning, Savannah. Yeah, the Vatican just updated about an hour ago on how the operation uh, went, uh, and it went very well. Now, they said that the uh, Pope uh, is well alert, that he's doing well overall, and that he's breathing on his own. Now, these were all the news that we've been waiting for since yesterday, when he surprisingly, all by su- taking every, everybody by surprise when they said that they were taking the, uh, the the Pope to the hospital for a what they called was a scheduled surgery. Uh, now, they said, of course, that this was... Um, a standard operation, but we're talking about an 84-year-old, and we're talking about the Pope here, of course, so there was a lot of apprehension uh, there. Now, they said in that statement uh, that the surgery lasted about three hours, and also that the Pope will have to remain in hospital for seven days. Uh, Well, it is a long time for a recovery, but of course, we're talking about an 84-year-old man and also the Pope, so uh, of course, they have to be particularly cautious there, Savannah. Yeah, absolutely. And Claudia, what do we know about the Pope's health in general? I mean, are Vatican officials concerned at all? Well, the uh, Pope's health has been, uh, we've known what the Pope's problem has been so far. Uh, One is the sciatica. Uh, He's had problems uh, walking or walking up the stairs or walking down the stairs. And that has been uh, increasingly more obvious. We've seen him struggling, limping. Uh, He needs help to uh, walk up the platforms or walk up the planes when he travel. Uh, He also had to cancel some events in the past because of the sciatica. Of course, that's not a major problem, but it causes Mm -hmm. uh, problems with his movement. He also, since he was a very young man, he had to have um, a uh, part of a lung removed because of an infection there, but it doesn't seem to have affected him throughout his life because at 84 year old, uh, he's a pretty active and energetic uh, man. So uh, this is certainly the first major surgery he had to undergo Mm. uh, since he was elected Pope Savannah. All right, Claudio Lavanga from on a gorgeous day, it looks like in Rome with a beautiful St. Peter's Basilica behind him. Thank you so much. The United States is withdrawing the last of its troops from Afghanistan after nearly 20 years of war. As that happens, the Taliban is taking over military posts from Afghan troops in a major test for the Afghan government and its security forces. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel has more from Kabul. Good morning, Savannah. Afghan security forces are collapsing even faster than U.S. intelligence estimates anticipated. And the Taliban are making lightning advances. Even before U.S. troops finish their withdrawal from Afghanistan, America's old enemies are making a comeback. The Taliban, the group that sheltered Osama bin Laden, allowing him to plan 9-11, is on a major offensive, capturing around 150 Afghan military outposts in the last two months, including nearly a dozen this weekend. In most cases, Afghan security forces, trained and funded by the United States, surrendered without firing a shot allowing the Taliban to seize weapons. But one group holding the line is the Afghan commandos. The elite troops trained by American special ops are now carrying out around 100 operations a day. About 90% of the combat missions, according to their commanding general. We are committed. We will fight them and we will push them back. But the Taliban's biggest gain so far appears to be psychological. The world watched this week as the U.S. left Bagram Air Base quietly, leaving in stealth for their security. The American withdrawal is a huge morale boost for the Taliban and all Islamic extremists, presenting the U.S. pullout as a God-given victory. Several Afghan officials tell NBC News al-Qaeda, ISIS and other radicals are returning to Afghanistan to witness and take part in what they're calling the final victory, the Taliban pushing out the world's greatest superpower. Once again, Afghanistan is becoming a magnet for al-Qaeda. They're coming here. They are coming and Afghanistan will be a graveyard for them as well. The terrorist threat is already rising. This week, Afghan airport security located a musical instrument packed with explosives designed to blow up a flight to Kabul. Al-Qaeda fighters and other foreign extremists are coming in from Pakistan. It's the same route Al-Qaeda used before 9-11. Savannah. All right, Richard, thank you. Let's look at what else is making news around the world this morning with NBC News foreign correspondent Matthew Bodner. He's in Moscow. Good morning, Matt. 
Savannah, good morning. Well, let's start things off in the Philippines, where a military transport uh, crashed, killing 50 and, and injuring uh, dozens more. Now, this plane was a C-130 built by Lockheed Martin, actually flew with the U.S. Air Force. And what happened is it overshot its runway while it was going into land uh, in Sulu province with uh, essentially military personnel to reinforce uh, an operation there uh, against Islamist militants. There is yet no information on what might have actually caused uh, this incident. Uh, moving on to the UK now, Kate Middleton, the Duchess of Cambridge, uh, has entered a 10-day self-isolation period uh, after coming into contact with someone who was later diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, now, Kensington Palace says that she's not showing uh, any symptoms yet, but this is just a precaution and she's just kind of uh, following the official government measures for this kind of uh, situation, but all good there. And uh, we'll finish things up in Ukraine, uh, where the Ministry of Defense is actually under fire after photos uh, emerged of female soldiers rehearsing for an upcoming military parade uh, wearing heels. Now, this parade will be in August. Uh, it's set to celebrate 30 years of Ukrainian independence after the Soviet Union collapsed uh, in 1991. Uh, and we've seen some suggestions from lawmakers uh, that the 66-year-old Minister of Defense uh, also wear heels for this parade. Savannah. Hmm. All right. Interesting. Matt, thank you so much. Coming up, a new world record for the hot dog king himself, Joey Chestnut. This year's jaw-dropping, probably jaw-aching performance from Coney Island up next. Hundreds turned out to Coney Island to watch the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest live. Joey Chestnut won for a 14th time, beating his own record of 75 by eating 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. That is about one hot dog every eight seconds. I don't even understand how that's possible. Last year, the event was held indoors and without an in-person audience because of the pandemic. There you go, 76 hot dogs. <laughs> All right, 27 years to the day after founding Amazon, Jeff Bezos is stepping down as CEO. So what's next for the world's richest man and the trillion dollar company he created? NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward joins us now. Jake, thank you so much for being up early in California for us and on this holiday Monday. We appreciate you being here to talk to us about this. So Bezos is stepping down as CEO, but he's still going to be involved with Amazon. Explain what his role is going to look like now. Well, you know, at this point, Savannah, the world is what he wants it to be, especially within the confines of Amazon. And in this case, Bezos has essentially kicked himself upstairs. He's going to be stepping away from all the day-to-day -day responsibilities of, of running, you know, the, the nation's, uh, what's projected to be the nation's largest employer, you know, uh, one of the most transformative effects on, on modern capitalism. Uh, you know, he's going upstairs. He doesn't have to deal with the day-to-day -day of the business itself. He's going to instead now be executive chairman as of today when he steps down as CEO and begins to take this sort of broader role. And when you're executive chairman of Amazon, Savannah, you can do what you like. You know, <laughs> you can uh, you can uh, focus on your philanthropy. You can uh, dip your toes into whatever you like. It, of course, all falls now to his successor to keep this just absolute behemoth running the way that Bezos intended, Savannah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about that successor, Andy Jassy. He's now going to lead Amazon. What do we know about him and what's it mean for the company? Well, he is a longtime Amazon employee, you know, one of its top lieutenants. He ran the AWS, the web services business that for years has been really the future of Amazon. It provides the back end hosting services for incredible numbers of businesses around the world and has become the sort of the national, sorry, the, the international leader when it comes to that. Now, here's the thing, Savannah, when you're Andy Jassy and you're handed the keys to this machine, you know, on the one hand, that would look like an incredible opportunity. Right, a moment in mm -hmm. which you're basically given a thing that's on a roll. I mean, the 40% revenue increase year after year. I mean, it's unbelievable how well Amazon seems to be working. But here's the thing. Bezos built this thing to be entirely a, a sort of a, a self-feeding uh, flywheel is what he called mm. it. And at a, in a new world of regulatory pressures and the rest of it, getting Jassy to get this thing through the world, keep it running the way that Bezos intended, that'll be the great challenge. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yikes. I don't envy that challenge, that's for sure. Um, just a minute ago, Jake, you mentioned that, that, that Bezos has, of course, these other businesses, philanthropy, that type of thing that he can step back to. So let's talk about what you think we'll see from him. Of course, we know he's launching himself into space shortly but what else can we expect? 
Yeah, that is the crazy thing, right? I mean, you know, to say, uh, uh, okay, I'm stepping down today as, you know, correspondent, right? If I were to do that and then say 15 days later, I'm going to go to space, yeah. which is his plan, right? That's not how I would wind down my, my time, but that's how he's going to do it. Um, going with his brother and, and others uh, to space in just 15 days as part of Blue Origins, his uh, effort to compete with the likes of uh, Branson and Musk for going to space privately. Um, he also, of course, owns the Washington Post. He could dabble into that further, uh, you know, uh, do more experimentation with journalism the way he has. Um, you know, he also has several philanthropic arms, um, the uh, Earth First uh, uh Nonprofit, uh, an Amazon One uh, nonprofit. You know, he, he is planning to use his uh, billions uh, for philanthropy as well. You know, it's it's really looking back at the efficiency machine mm. that this man created and the effect that that has created. The expectation on all of us that you can literally have whatever you want delivered to you overnight. You know, that idea is incredible. I'm curious to see psychologically for him what's it like to step away from really having transformed capitalism and just become a philanthropist. Will he be able to do that, undoubtedly, you know, it's it's not a uh, you know a stretch to think that he will probably bring mm. some of that incredible energy and incredible efficiency yeah. um, to that world as well, Savannah. Jake, I'm also curious to see, especially now that he is stepping back today, he's going to have some time. Do we think he's going to move up his space date because Richard Branson said he's going to go first? We'll see. <laughs> I know. Billionaires. Billionaires <laughs> yeah, and, and their race to space. It's a weird world. What a life. All right, right, Jake. Thank you so much and happy fourth. Home prices are hitting record highs and some potential buyers are willing to pay or do almost anything to get into a new home. However, as NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule shows us, some people's dream homes are quickly becoming nightmares. Desiree Davis is a first time home buyer in Canton, Ohio. This is our second story bathroom. Um, obviously, we haven't been able to use it. And since she's moved in, this is the kitchen sink. Doesn't work. It's been anything but home sweet home. There was sewage coming up out of this drain pipe. After being outbid four times on other houses, Davis decided to forego the home inspection in order to guarantee she'd be able to move in. Wasn't probably the smartest idea. But if you look at the house, it's a pretty house. We just kind of got duped. We really got duped. Numerous. What has been the worst part of this ordeal? Oh, my God. I, like, I cry every day. I literally cry every day. Every single day something happens. And Davis isn't alone. According to Bankrate, 64% of millennials, 45% of Gen X, and 33% of baby boomers regret their home purchases. For reasons like overpaying for their property, high maintenance costs, poor location, or wrong house size. A product of a highly competitive housing market during the pandemic, buyers are making offers sight unseen and waiving contingencies to win bidding wars. This house looked great online, but I should have actually seen, you know, seen it in person and really taken more time to decide on what kind of lifestyle we wanted to have when we came here. I have multiple raccoons. With everything from a raccoon infestation in the chimney to a septic tank that wasn't supposed to be there, Davis is fed up. I'm really just, in, I'm just stuck now. I'm stuck. I'm stuck in this house. Everyone get inspections done, no matter what. And it should be against the law. It really should. It should be a requirement. Davis hopes future homeowners heed her cautionary tale so their dream homes don't become money pits. Stephanie Rule, NBC News. On a special edition of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd discussed the country's pandemic response with Dr. Anthony Fauci and a team of panelists. Here are the highlights. On this week's Meet the Press, we focused on COVID, the comeback from the brink and the challenges that we face ahead. I spoke with who else but Dr. Anthony Fauci, but I also spoke with Dr. Seth Berkley. He's the CEO of a global vaccine alliance called Gavi. Their goal is to vaccinate the rest of the world, plus my roundtable on the reopening and our ways of life that are going to change perhaps permanently. Here are some of the most important answers from Meet the Press Compressed. It's disconcerting to realize that we had nearly 10,000 people die of COVID in this most recent month that we completed in June. How preventable were each one of those deaths and how many of them were unvaccinated? Well, if you look at the number of, of deaths, about 99.2% of them are unvaccinated, about 0.8% are vaccinated. Uh, no vaccine is perfect. Uh, but when you talk about the avoidability 
of hospitalization and deaths, Chuck, it's really sad and tragic that most all of these are avoidable and preventable. If ever there was a situation where you had a pandemic that was as destructive as this, the one thing you'd want to do is realize that you're dealing with a common enemy, the virus, and not have the kind of divisiveness that we've had in our country. I can't give you a quantitation of how many deaths would have been avoided if we did not have that, but I'm certain there certainly would have been some that would have been avoided, and maybe a lot. In some ways, America's in its own bubble with its vaccine supply. While you are trying to, to figure out how to vaccinate the world, how dire would you paint the situation right now globally? This is a global pandemic. It started in a point outbreak in China, and it very rapidly spread around the world. And I think the challenge we started with is to remind people that you're only safe if everyone's safe, because viruses will mutate and they'll continue to move. And that's what we've seen. I think initially people were not taking that seriously. And we saw a lot of vaccine nationalism. If you look at high income countries, about 40 percent of the populations are vaccinated. But in low income countries, it's still less than 1%. And I think when India, the, 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 the variant that came out of India, the Delta variant occurred, I think people woke up and said, yes, this is true, because that went to 40 countries and now to 85 countries. And we have to keep in mind that this may not be the last variant. So what we need is a global process. And we're not really there yet in terms of getting the coverage we need. We're not normal yet. And part of that is the stress that a lot of Americans are still feeling about reentry, about going back to, you know, the old commuting and the old going to the office and all of those things, school even. I think right now we're in the summer of reset, right? We're in a period where we need to get back our health, our mental health, our well-being and really reset before I think fall in a lot of parts of the country will be a real challenge because people will be expected to go back to their employment. Coming up, it's official. America is back on the road, and we've got the numbers from this weekend to prove it. That is up next. The July 4th holiday weekend, which we're, of course, still in, saw record-breaking numbers of travelers across the country. Now people are hitting the air and road to make their way back home. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas joins us now from LAX. Guad, good morning. How is it there so far? I know it's super early. Thanks for being up. Good morning, Savannah. People are coming to the airport. Well, they're going to have to be patient because we expect crowds coming out. You know, we know that they pack the skies, they pack the roads as well. And also a lesson for the travel and hospitality industry, because now they know they're going to have to catch up. An Independence Day weekend to liberate Americans stuck at home during the pandemic. So I think everyone wants to travel right now. New records set. As experts say, we reached the peak for travel today. It's psycho now. It took us like 40 minutes to get through security yeah. to get here. Yeah. The TSA screening almost 2.2 million people on Friday, the highest number since the start of the pandemic. That same day, Gas Buddy reporting the greatest single day demand for gas since 2019. All despite high gas prices averaging $3.12, almost a dollar more than a year ago. It was a lot more than I was expecting to pay. But gas wasn't the only expensive part of the weekend. You're seeing rental car shortages. It's hard to get a dinner reservation. Hotels are going for exorbitant prices. They're adding COVID fees right and left. Travelers wondering, how did things get so expensive? Demand has come back incredibly quickly. Um, and we've seen prices driven primarily by renewed travel demand. California, Florida, and Hawaii accounting for a quarter of all car rentals and flights. Some airlines overwhelmed. American Airlines, Southwest, Delta, they can't keep up with demand. They don't have the staffing for it. Many of them offering incentives like double pay and $100 bonuses to staff working through the weeks to come. Where everyone is traveling, everyone wants to get out. We've been cooped up for way too long. A new start for travelers, hoping it's the end of the pandemic. Now, the good news is with this high demand, companies are going to be hiring all across the country. So anyone looking to get a job in the hospitality industry, now is the time, Savannah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Guad, thank you so much. 
After an explosive qualifying run, American sprinter Shakari Richardson says she will not be making a dash for gold in the Tokyo Games after testing positive for marijuana. Many fans expressed outrage on social media under the hashtag Let Her Run. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is here on set with us with the latest. Hi, Kathy. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you in person. Uh, I know well, you too. Um, so the she, story is absolutely. Just, this has been quite the talker. Yeah, it definitely has. Uh, so Shakari Richardson, she has been described as a flojo of our time when she takes off running. It's hard not to notice her. And while she was a gold medal favorite in her signature 100 meter dash, it now appears she'll be sitting on the sidelines. Star sprinter Shakari Richardson breaking her silence about competing in the summer games, tweeting, I'm sorry I can't be all Olympic champ this year, but I promise I'll be your world champ next year. The 21-year-old accepting a one-month suspension after testing positive for marijuana. She turned heads with her speed and style dominating in the 100-meter dash last month, a victory now invalidated because of the drug violation. In an exclusive interview on Today, she said she used marijuana to cope after learning of the death of her biological mother from a reporter. I know what I did. I know what I'm supposed to do. Um, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm allowed not to do. And I still made that decision, but um, not making an excuse. Hundreds of thousands now signing an online petition to let Shakari run. Athletes, celebrities, and public figures coming to her defense. Actor Seth Rogen denouncing the suspension, tweeting, If weed made you fast, I'd be Flojo. President Biden also weighed in over the weekend. The rules are the rules. Whether they should remain that, that should remain the rules, a different issue. But I was really proud of the way she responded. And the Olympics controversy doesn't end there. The International Swimming Federation received swift backlash for banning swim caps designed for natural black hair. British brand Soul Cap responding to the rejection, writing, How do we achieve participation and representation in the world of competition swimmers if the governing body stops suitable swimwear being available to those who are underrepresented? The Swimming Federation acknowledged the reactions, writing they are reviewing the situation while understanding the importance of inclusivity and representation. And a message of gratitude was posted on Soul Cap's website for the overwhelming amount of support they've received. The company added that they are seeing a huge number of new orders and asked for patience as they get the caps out as fast as possible. Oh, all right, Kathy, thank you so much. So much to watch for there, especially as we start seeing some of these COVID cases pop up with yeah. athletes. We shall see, but yeah, we're getting pretty close. Continue. Yeah, thank you so much. Good to see you. Thanks you for being too. here. Coming up, from Maine to the middle of Manhattan, the story behind the success of a New York City lobster shack turned worldwide sensation up next. You may have seen a Luke's Lobster Shack in your city, but did you know there's an actual Luke behind them? Luke Holden is a third generation lobster man, but it took a career in finance, a Craigslist ad, and meeting co-founder Ben Conniff in New York City to get him to return to his roots and realize a new dream in the process. Here's more on their story. I loved the excitement of dropping a trap overboard, letting it sit for a couple of days, and hauling it up and just wondering what was inside. Luke Holden grew up on the Maine coast, obsessed with lobster. I'm actually a third generation lobsterman, so I grew up on the working waterfront. I love this industry. I love being a part of it. After graduating from college and getting a job in finance, it was that first love that sparked an idea. But you didn't think at first that you necessarily were going to do this, right? I had a great experience on it. It was just, it was a job. I was sitting at my desk on a summer Sunday afternoon. I was missing home. I went online looking for something that reminded me of home, which was a Maine style lobster roll. <laughs> and there was nothing. So Luke approached his dad with a business proposal to bring a quintessential Maine lobster shack to the middle of Manhattan. He looked at it, he said, I think you can open a lobster shack in New York City for 35,000 bucks? And I said, yeah, I think I can, let's try it. And so he actually borrowed against his 401k to come up with half the money. Okay, so you've got the money, you're like, I need a partner. So what'd you do? I wrote this post up that I put on Craigslist. It's like, first time I've ever probably gone on Craigslist. <laughs> You'd never needed the couch or something before. <laughs> and the post was something like, I have no experience, <laughs> limited funding, and like we just gotta figure this out together. And I got like 
700 responses, <laughs> and then I come across Ben's. I met Luke and it was immediately clear that like this is a guy who has one passion his whole life, oh. and that's lobster. The two signed a lease and just 30 days later opened Luke's Lobster. I left Ben and my father that morning at like 8.30. Because you, by the way, still have a day job. I'm like, good luck. I'm not really expecting that really we're going to do any sales. So it's like noontime and absolute crickets. At 2 o'clock, either Ben or my father services when they're like, yeah, there's a line around the block. Like Jeff's heading back up to Maine to go get more lobster. Seven months later, Luke quit his day job. I took the $35,000 salary and no health insurance. I was all in. What'd your mom think of that? My mom cried. But her concern was short-lived. Over the next 10 years, Luke and Ben launched 40 lobster shacks across the country and world. Oh. All right. Wow, it's kind of interesting you put the shoe on first. And they did something else to expand, too. We realized that having the direct connection to the fishermen, we were ultimately going to have to control our own destiny by starting our own seafood production plant mm. here in Maine and not having to kind of go out on the open market and buy a lobster from whoever happened to be selling. Today, Luke's <laughs> Lobster controls everything from ocean to table. Well, we've been in charge of that lobster from the moment it was caught. <laughs> All right. But when COVID hit, so did a whole new set of problems. It was like, I was a little kid. I literally called my father and I said, I just need you to come to work today. Ugh. And I was like, just crying. We were over 600 people at the height of 2019. We laid off everybody besides 23 people. Wow. Which is crazy. And then we just, um, <laughs> yeah, I know, it's hard. And then we just like started making plants. Slowly but surely, they've built back. I mean, how do things feel for you right now? There's like light at the end of the tunnel. The sun is starting to shine. It's lobster roll season. Speaking of which, all right. I have to tell you all something, a little bit of a confession. This is actually going to be my first lobster roll. What? Like ever. That blows my mind, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I know you have two little daughters. Do you think this is going to be a fourth generation lobstering family? I have a three year old who will have a license when she's seven. <laughs> I want them to be very comfortable in the ocean and, and I suspect they'll love just the excitement of, mm -hmm. of putting that trap into the ocean and pulling up and seeing what's inside. And, <laughs> and I'm like really excited to teach them about that. Ooh. Oh! My thanks to Luke and Captain Steve, who taught me how to fish for lobster. Now, 4th of July took on an even bigger meaning this year as we celebrated our independence, along with the reopening of our country and the return of big events. Here are some of the celebrations from around the country. We hope you enjoyed that video of fireworks in case you missed any yourself last night. That does it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Happy 4th of July. And of course, thank you to our veterans who make this country what it is. Hey, NBC News viewers. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives.
Thanks for watching.